I want to run through some notable moments from your career. How about how the Mark McGuire interview came about and your view on what he said? Mark McGuire is a really nice guy. Um, I think he's very sincere in the way he lives his life, uh, not approving of taking steroids, but I think he has a lot of virtues as a person. I've always liked him. He and I always had a good relationship. Um, so when the time came that he wanted to come clean, at least to the extent that he did about this, he had to choose a place that would be credible. It, it wouldn't have done him any good to go to some softball interview. And it came down to 60 Minutes or the Major League Baseball Network. And I think he chose MLBN because it was open-ended. We could do an hour, 90 minutes, whatever it was. This was live uh, and unedited. I knew that he was going to acknowledge that he had used steroids. I was very surprised when he then said that the only benefit I got from it was that it helped me recover from my injuries and stay on the field and do what I naturally would have done anyway. And, you know, he was getting very emotional. He was crying. Um, he apologized to everybody, to the Cardinals, to the commissioner, especially to Roger Maris's family, et cetera. Um, and I kept trying to gently suggest, I must have given him a half dozen chances. Wait a minute, didn't you see, even though you were a powerful hitter, hit 49 homers as a rookie, didn't you see that you were even better than you had been? Can't you see the cluster of Sammy Sosa seasons, Barry Bonds seasons, guys who hit 18 home runs all of a sudden hitting 45 home runs? Can't you see a correlation here? And he could never acknowledge it. And so far as I know to this day, he can't acknowledge it. I don't think he's being consciously dishonest. I think that he's convinced that that is the truth. Um, but at least, even if he didn't fully come around on what most of us would like to have seen him acknowledge, at least he acknowledged something. Almost nobody else has acknowledged it. March of 88, Runyon's, you're hosting Costas Coast to Coast on the radio. Yep. Uh, your longtime producer and friend, Bruce, told me the two of you were at your apartment beforehand going over and over and over your preparations. And Bruce said it's the only time in his entire life working with you that Was he, this could Ted tell, Williams? he could tell yeah. you were anxious to get it right. Well, you have to consider the context. In 1988, there weren't as many broadcast outlets. The internet didn't exist. Plus, Ted Williams had not done an interview of any consequence anywhere with anyone in like 20 years. And he was Ted Williams. There was a tremendous mystique around him. So I knew that this interview would have to be not just good, it would have to be close to definitive because this was the great Ted Williams, the icon of all Red Sox icons, and he was speaking. It was like the, just short of if J.D. Salinger decided to break his silence. So I had to get this right in terms of making sure I didn't leave anything important unaddressed. I had done a lot of work on Williams because of Boston, so I knew some stuff, and, Ted, and Bob knew everything about Ted. But we went over things and over things and over things. It's one of the rare times, the only other time is Paul McCartney. Two times I can think of Bob who can prepare at a minute's notice. He wanted to make sure all the box were checked. And luckily, you know, he liked me. And there was a, a rapport almost immediately. I heard you say one time you could smell the wood burning when you fouled a pitch off. <laughs> Well, it's absolutely the truth. Now, when I said that, we were the Boggs and Mattingly that night. He talked about how he couldn't bring himself to tip his cap when he hit a home run in his last time at bat at Fenway Park in 1960. He never tipped his cap because some of the fans had booed him and the press had been tough on him and he, you know, he could be tempestuous himself. And he said between second and third, I thought my arm went, went I, but I couldn't quite do it. Damn it, I couldn't quite do it. And that was the end of it. And toward the end of the interview, I said, you know what? You actually are the guy in real life that John Wayne played in all those movies. And for a moment, I saw him pause like, well, I don't want to sound immodest, 
but his blunt honesty got the better of whatever modesty, and his answer was, yeah, I know it. What did he say to the book publicist after your interview oh, about the next day's Today Show interview? Yeah, I didn't help the Today Show. He was selling a book, my turn at bat. So I hear in the back from behind me, the Today Show publicist, don't forget, Ted, car picking you up at 7.30. It's an eight o'clock shot on the Today Show. An eight o'clock shot on the Today Show for a book, for a book publicist is like an ATM, okay? So Ted bellows, and it's such a cliched word, but it's the only word I, verb I can think of, bellows. I'm not doing that. And so the publicist said, said Ted, we're all set. We've got it set. He said, no, no. He points to Bob and he says, he knows everything about baseball. I said, I talked to him because he knows that. I'm not sure what the Today Show knows. I'm not doing it. Okay. I said all I wanted to say to Bob, I'm not doing it. And he walked out. <laughs> this is not the way you sell a book. You know, to, to pass up a, a shot on the Today Show. But he felt that he'd said his piece that the night before with me, so he didn't do it.